Hello, hello, everyone. It's Tori Indeed from Vibe to Vibe UN TV, and I have a very special guest, Vincent Desiderio, painter, realist. I'm glad that you say that they, they, they touch upon something that's real because that is the most important aspect of it. Even if you make it you know, out of your head uh, and invent it, the point of it all is, is to touch a, a nerve that is. Uh, that represents something of the real, something that is seems authentic to some extent. Right. You know, it's particularly difficult in these times when everything is sort of uh, done at arm's length. You know, we kind of uh, uh, have we're suspicious of anything that attempts to be authentic unless it fits the bill in terms of what's the, you know expected of things. So right. So. Does your art display, like, in other words, reading between the lines? Yeah, that's right. There, there always seems to be a subtext happening. You might be looking at a painting of a child, for example, but there's some maybe something lurking in the background. Uh, the vulnerability of a child, for example, or if uh, you know, that's part of the uh, you know the, the way painters make pictures is that you know this. Uh, Marguerite said that uh, he did a painting of a pipe and he said, uh, this is not a pipe he wrote on it. And that's the point, is that paintings really are uh, not really, they're, they're ironic events. They they look like one thing and they often mean something else. You're also a critic. Well, just for the New York Academy. Oh, for the New York Academy. I used to be with the Pennsylvania Academy, but I'm not with them anymore. Okay. It's really simply the title that they give me at the school. Uh, in other words, all of us as teachers at you know at universities or in our art uh, academies uh, serve as critics in that sense. I mean, we look at the student work and we talk to them about it. And oh wow. That's, really, that's more of the uh, the nature of that that particular title. Uh, being a painter is far better than being a critic. Critics don't do it. They just, they stand on the sidelines and watch in terms of the people who write criticism for right. newspapers. I mean, they stand on the sidelines. They watch people do the thing that maybe they wanted to do, but couldn't possibly manage to do it. And they proclaim whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether this or that. You know, it's much better to be a painter because when you're a painter, you encounter things that other people don't encounter. Right. Once you're in that process of, right, of, there are things that occur to you that would never have occurred to you outside of that process, and criticism exists outside of that process. And so uh, I'm very, you know, I'm a little skeptical and suspicious of a lot of what's written about. It. Although I'm very happy that people write about it because you do it so that it can generate conversation. Right. 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 So you you would give them honest feedback, but you wouldn't um, say like their work is horrible. You would oh, just no. maybe, yes. I would never do that. Uh, you know, the thing is that nobody can sort of tell whether someone is going to be able to put the pieces together in, in right. a particular way that's going to work for them. And who am I to actually say, you know, hey, that's crap. You know, I, I would never say that. You have to nurture everyone. Yeah. You have to be nurtured. I mean, they're, you have to have faith in them, like they have faith in themselves. You have to try to encourage them to do the best that they possibly can do. And that's that's your job. Your job is not to tell them this is wrong, that's wrong. It's to you right. know, put them into being able to do their best. Really, that's, that's how I see the role of the critic in school. That's a very nice thing, especially when you're in that uh, position to be a critic and to give feedback on work and advice and everything. You know, sometimes people can be harsh. So I'm happy that you're very, um, you know, understanding and nurturing and open minded even. Picture's worth a thousand words. The point of making the picture is to make it so that it's worth a thousand words, not to make it so that a thousand words can accompany it. Right. You want the picture to speak totally for itself. Right. And it's speaking for itself within a tradition of painting that is very long, it stretches way back to caveman days. You know, so uh, you're, deal you're entering a conversation that has been going on for, you know, 
mil, a million years. There are thousands and thousands of years. Uh, right. That's, that's a beautiful thing about that. Words, too. But, you know, the painting, nothing takes the place of a painting. It's the greatest. It's, it, painting and filmmaking are the two, to, to me, and music are the three greatest uh, forms of art for me. You started off as one painting, and then you added on top of that painting. That's what I'm writing the book about. Dead white. And that's your vision of today? Uh, it's my vision of a kind of period of history. Okay. Uh, you know, like the beginning of something, the end of something. Uh, you know, it might refer to dead white man. Right. You know, in fact, I, I would say, but it's also a pun on the word dead, uh, lead white. It sort of sounds like lead white, the kind of paint that people used in the past. Uh, but it's it's really more like an apocalypse or a kind of uh, a godless last judgment. Or, uh, it's uh, but it, it it's a painting. That's one of those paintings that took me a really long time to actually come to terms with, in terms of how I was going to paint it. Um, I I had been thinking about it for a year before I even did the painting, and then oh really. Know, Studies, yeah, I did all these studies and one on top of the other, on top of the other, until finally I uh, wow, I was able to do the painting. And the really weird thing was that I did the painting in seven days. Well, I had prepared so much for it, you know, I'd been thinking about it, and I did so many studies for it. Uh, that and and when I finished the studies, I thought the studies were terrible, and I said, I'm not going to do this painting, it's horrible. And then I just said, oh, I'm going to do it. And I just did it. And it popped out in seven days. There's so much to learn. I mean, it's, it's, you never stop learning. There's so many ways to manipulate the materials, you know. Uh, not only that, to actually attach your material manipulations to your thought. You know, that's like a muscle that you have to exercise. Like, how do you actually attach your thought as clearly as as uh, most economically uh, uh, to your manner of working. You know, how do you do it? You know, you, you, you can just pretend it doesn't exist, but you can also focus on it. You can, I mean, you can pretend it just comes naturally, or you can focus on it and say, why am I doing this? Why do I naturally do that? Why don't I do it this way? Why don't I change what I'm doing? Why don't I take uh, something in my hand or paint with a rock instead of a brush. You know, right. You know, what if I take the, 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 the thing that I'm most used to out of the equation and I, I work out of my comfort zone in a way? What kinds of things do, do, will I, will I uh, you know, wh why will I still wind up doing the same things just with a, just with a rock instead of a brush? You know? It's right. Nice how your brain is working, how you think. Right. In creating, I just have to try things to get the vision that I want. If you give me a bookshelf to build, I can look at an image and just build it myself. Right. I might not right. go in the right, the, the steps they recommend in order, but I'll get it done. You know, I always think outside of the the box. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand that. Now, people, people's brains work differently. I mean, you know, yes. you know, it's like when you're in school. You get like the, the kids who can follow all the directions, do everything absolutely perfectly, and they get the grades, you know. And there are people who just take the circuitous route. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> me too. And it might be that later, you know, when they're older, they experience so much outside of the regularity of the whole thing that they're able to do multiple things and bring all sorts of insight into those things because they've already traversed all this strange territory as they were trying to you know come up with the answers for things we yeah in the box you know but that's how yeah i've been called i've been called scatterbrained because I, I think about like a lot of things at once um <laughs> and i'm just like but i get things done and, I, and i'm and i'm creative and then you know i go outside of the the box i go above and beyond <laughs> that's good that's what you should do Right. A creative person does, you know, uh, they really, they need to be there. They need to go there. It, it nurtures them. It, it, it encourages them. They get yeah. excited by that. You know? Right. And inspired by that. 
You know, they're not inspired by going from this to that to that. That's why I don't like to look at something and paint it. Like, I can't, I, if I looked at, I could paint anything, but if I, if I say, oh, I'm going to paint that, the thing that's in front of me, I have no interest at all in it. Right. Because it's so limited, and I like to have the idea in my head and then go crazy with it in regard to where it could possibly go, what it could possibly mean, what it refers to, how it could possibly be done, you know? Right. All the, and how it relates to the entire history of art. And a lot of those guys were not painting what they saw either. I mean, where was Michelangelo standing when he painted the creation of man? You know, it was like, hold that pose, guys. No, <laughs> there, right? So he, he, they were inventing the stuff uh, visually. And right. That, but that's like thinking in a way outside of the box for me. Right. And, and what's your favorite kind of art? There are a couple of artists that, I, I mean, I love Cicely Brown's work. Um, she's one of my favorite artists now. But, you know, Antonio Lopez is, uh, to me, he's a hero. And uh, uh, Antonio really? Lopez, uh, yeah. You know his work? The Spanish painter. He's a genius. I love him. He's a friend of mine. But, oh, uh, really? I, yeah, I, that kind of thing, I... Those two artists are artists that, but there are a lot of things. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want my own work. I mean, I'd rather not even look at it again. To me, once I finish it, they're like corpses, you know? It's like I get everything out of them that I can, and I just don't want to see them again. You know? Right. But um, I would like to be able to talk to some artists uh, from the past. Oh, um, who would that be? Well, I'd love to talk to Michelangelo, first of all. I was going to say, would it be him? <laughs> Definitely. He's my hero. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to talk to uh, Picasso and Velasquez and de Kooning. And wow, lots, yeah. Lots of people. There are so many that I'd love to have conversation with. I used to talk to my friend at school, Tom. We used to talk about, you know, when we die, if we go to heaven, heaven's going to be the big dinner table. And we'll be sitting there with all the artists that we love. I won't be able to just have a dinner conversation. It'll just go on forever. Right, right. I think the verb, the the verbiage, and maybe um, the terminologies would be a little different. <laughs> like they were talking there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That'd be so cool. That'd be so cool. <laughs> have like a translator there. <laughs> so I know you've been doing for this this for. You're a painter. Were you born a painter? Like when you were very young, you picked up, you know, just doodling, drawing, sketching, painting, or did it come to you um, a little later in life where you were more mature? I, well, you know, like all kids, I drew. I drew a lot. I think I remember one day in particular, um, a lady who lived across the street from us came over and there was a thunderstorm. And she, I was very, very little, like maybe five years old. Or, or younger, and she said, uh, to try to keep us, you know, happy, she said, uh, we're going to draw horrible horribles. So she had us draw monsters. Uh, really? It was the most fun I ever had in my life uh, at that time. I just was so, I, all I wanted to do was draw horrible horribles. And when we were, I was really little, like three uh, my brother, older brother, and I would look at an art book that my mother had. And so from the time I was very, very little, I was uh, I was familiar with, you know, paintings by Van Eyck and Picasso and Michelangelo and uh, Giotto, all sorts of painters, because we look at Edvard Munch. We looked at these books all the time, this book all the time. And it was kind of scary. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know why any why an adult would make a scary thing like this. I found the art scary, actually, to tell you the truth. Yeah, and then, but when I was twelve, I just got very like totally wrapped up in the Renaissance. Like all I wanted to do was be Michelangelo. So uh, I I I asked my parents if I could paint the creation of man on a garage ceiling and build a scaffold, and they said no, of course not, you can't. So they went off somewhere for a weekend, and I took a ladder and I started painting the creation of man on the garage ceiling. Uh, 
and they came home and I thought they were going to yell at me, but they didn't. They were very proud of me. So I just continued and I painted this thing and I just, I started carving marble uh, when I was 14 uh, just to try it. I didn't get very far with it, but I did ahead. Uh, I just wanted to be Michelangelo. It was like insane. I wanted to be in the Renaissance. And that was when I was little. Uh, you know, and as I got older, I got over the Renaissance thing, but never. Right. I, I still love it. I still read about it all the time. I like. I, I read about Renaissance history, about philosophy, about the writers of Renaissance. It's, I'm, it's just an obsessed with it, but also about so much more. Uh, there's so many other things in the history of art, but that's how I got sort of got started. That was a long time ago. Wow. Thank you for sharing. I definitely, I really love that story about you just, you went on and you still painted on the garage. <laughs> <laughs> it was really insane. <laughs> oh my gosh. So that's, that's when, um, is that the point where maybe your family or your parents started taking your art seriously a bit more or listen to you? Like if you wanted to paint something. Yeah. They, they, uh, and they were very, very encouraging. I mean, my father would come home every night with art books. Really? Every night. And then he would, uh, they bought me materials and they they were totally, he wanted me to be a doctor though. And he said, you can paint, you know, in your spare time. But then eventually we had a big sort of discussion about, it and he realized that I was not going to be a doctor. Like my older brother, and, uh, like he was a doctor. I wanted to be a painter. And you studied art as well, right? Yeah, I, I studied art and art history a lot, literature. I went to, you know, Haverford College. And it was a liberal arts college in Pennsylvania and studied, you know, some philosophy and literature, history, of course, art history, languages, that sort of thing. From seeing like Dead White, it was, it was more dark. <laughs> Um, well, but are, are there some fun materials you like to have, or what are some of your favorite yeah. materials? I use, uh, surprisingly, I use, sometimes I use roofing tar. You know, that's stuff that comes in a can that you put on your roof that's black. Oh, wow. And it, and it's like a roof, a flashing cement, really. And I take a glove, a latex glove. I was I calling take, it tar, but. <laughs> yeah, and I stick my hand in the, in the can and I draw with it with my hand and I love that oh my gosh that's like my favorite meat material to use besides oil paint <laughs> wow that's pretty awesome and also your art is going to be on the cover of the most influential art magazine yeah congratulations <laughs> whoa whoa <laughs> the dark the gory the everything what are some beautiful pictures or like how can I say, not so gory, but maybe beauty? My children. Oh my gosh. My children. I love painting. I love when I paint them. I painted my wife. Uh, that's, that's beautiful to me. I don't think there's anything more beautiful than children. I love them. I love them with all my heart. They're my hope. They make me feel like I want to get up in the morning. We had four, we had three of our other than my first wife, and then we adopted our our last one, a fourth one. She's Chinese, uh, and her name was Lily, and she now she's a freshman in college. But we got her when she was eleven months old. She's oh my like gosh. so beautiful. I mean, I love. I have a Chinese daughter. I can't believe it. It's so cute. <laughs> I absolutely adore that. So tell me, did any of them pick up art or um, have been influenced by your artwork? Uh, well, uh, I think it's funny is that, yeah, they all are. Ian, uh, my, my, well, my first one saying is multiply handicapped, but he loves music and he has a great memory. Uh, Oscar is a, a composer and a, a guitarist and he also works in production. Uh, Ian, uh, my son Ian is, uh, teaches art and is a sculptor. Um, really? Really amazing. He works with people who are uh, 
who are disabled, uh, or had me mental, dis you know, uh, handicaps and physical handicaps. And uh, Lily does everything, you know, from drawing to he plays the piano. They all, they're all musicians. Wow. Uh, and Lily plays the piano and the cello. So they, they're into the arts, but not usually in regard to me, it's like, you know, Dad, what are you doing? Googling yourself again? You know? What? <laughs> It's like they don't want a they don't want an artist they want a father, you right? Know? They really don't care about it, and now they're older and they're understanding more. But when they're little, you know, they just dad come upstairs. You painted yesterday. Oh. You know? <laughs> dad, and what are you doing? Googling yourself again? Oh <laughs> my god. <laughs> That is hilarious. But you know what? There are many different forms of art. So I feel like you're, wow, that's your house is full. I'm going to have to interview your whole family, even your grandson. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to interview everyone because somehow, some way you have influenced them. And yes, dad, come on. You painted yesterday. As kids, we love to doodle. We love to draw. Right. So, I mean, at one point we do get tired and want to move on to whether it's handheld video games or playing outside, riding your bike, you know. So for them, it's like, all right, we paint all the time. We draw all the time. <laughs> I just want to hang yeah, out with they, dad. <laughs> they, they, they do. I'm, I'm proud of them. I'm really proud of them. You know, they're, they're, they think all, all of them think outside of the box. All of them. Yeah. You know, one and, thing you can't teach is that or common sense, right? You can't teach someone. Right, that, that, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love the fact that you are definitely um, a family man and has influenced your whole family. And, yes, I love the fact that you have a Chinese baby. <laughs> well, now, young adult. <laughs> oh, she's so cute. She's so cute. But she's <laughs> Yeah, she's an adult, so I can't really say. Yeah, now she's an adult. She's an adult. <laughs> I know you've gotten like several several grants for your you know your paintings and your series. Um, you got uh, painting awards. You were the first American to receive um, an international award from Monaco. Mon Monaco. That's why I was like, your global public collections, your art is in museums, art art galleries, or museums in New York. Um, Pennsylvania, Kansas. I was doing like all these research, this all this research on you. I'm like, wow, this guy's everywhere. Yeah, you're everywhere. doing too much research. Stop I don't want to dig up dirt now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! And the tell me, oh, okay, let's wrap it up with the theses. You have a theses. Tell me a little bit about that, or. That painting, Theseus? Yes. Okay. Um, well, uh, boy, uh, you know, I did three versions of it. I did okay. one version that was like the figures all through. I wanted to kind of do a painting that was a cross between a, a, a Northern European Last Judgment and a Jackson Pollock, you know, that was all over the place, uh, and all over the campus. And uh, I did, uh, I, I thought I was doing some a different kind of painting when I started it. It just started to evolve. And you know, if you took an x-ray of that picture, you would see like all these other different figures in it because I changed it so many times, you know, in the course of doing it. If I didn't like the way the figure was, I would like flip it or, you know, change it or just re redraw right. it. So, um, and so I did that painting, and then I said, well, what do I do? I want to demonstrate that within abstract painting, the same principles are at work, certain kinds of abstract painting that I like. And I did another version of it that was abstract. Actually, I did one in China, and then when I was teaching, I was teaching in China, uh, and I did the painting there, big painting, and then I did another painting of it, another version of it, and then I did a third version of it, which was like a negative of it, uh, that looked almost, that wound up looking like uh, like uh, cells under a microscope, the forms, instead of bodies, they were oh, wow. like, glowing forms. Uh, so it, it underwent three different changes. Uh, you know, it comes from the idea originally originated with 
to that. It's too boring to talk about, but it was that idea uh, <laughs> that the literary that the the, the literary critic uh, um, Roland Barth had regarding uh, what criticism was, as opposed to what the work of art was. Right. That's the boat of Theseus, which is an old Greek paradox. You know, uh, the uh, the paradox is that Theseus. Theseus gets on his boat and he does all the different things. Like he kills the Minotaur, and, everything. and then, and in the course of all of his journeys, the boat parts of the boat start to fall apart or rot, and he has to replace them. So he goes back finally to Athens, and he's replaced all the parts of the boat. You know, it's completely it's the same structure, but all the parts have been replaced. And then someone comes along and brings all the parts that he discarded and constructs the boat again next to it. And the question that they wondered, which one of them is actually the bark of pieces? Is it the one that he discarded? Or is it, or is it the one that was refurbished that was in the way? Now it sounds like not much of an issue for us, but it's about identity. You know, how we, uh, how we recognize something as the thing itself, as opposed to a replica of the thing or, you know, what is the, and so I wanted to do a painting that was about that. Bach would say that criticism is to a work of art what the, the Bach of Dante is to the original thing. Right. So I was trying to do a painting based on that. And I kind of blew it, and then I started another painting. I said, I'm not going to deal with that at all. And so I started this painting, and by the time I was finished, and I said, you know what? I made the Bach of Dante. I mean, the Bach of uh, pieces, because I took all these parts from another kind of time and stuck them into a format that was of our time. And right. What, is it a work of art in the end? Is it, is it the part of Theseus? Uh, I don't know. This is the kind of problem. <laughs> uh, you know, that's what my kids are all crazy. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like, I, are you, um, do you usually do that, like, paint on top of your paintings? Oh, yeah. You know, a painting changes so much. The trick is to make it look like it just happened that way. And not to let anyone really see that underneath the surface of it is you've had to change your mind a million times. Of course, a hundred years from now, it just might come through, the paint. <laughs> right. Paint. That's called pentimento. Uh, when the artist repents having, you know, had to change it. But really, my, in my paintings, you know, there are so many changes going on all the time that if you were to x-ray them, you would see a million different paintings underneath each painting. Wow. And how do you, how do you accept criticism or listen to criticism or react to it? Uh, badly. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, is it is it like badly where, okay, I don't care. That's what you think. Okay, cool. Or is it like, do you want to educate them on why you perhaps used a certain technique? No, no, no. If, if, they, if someone likes it, they like it. If they don't like it, they don't like it. You know, I can't right. make it like it or not. Uh, I mean, I know I'm not going to please everyone. I'm not, that's not my job. My job is to Oh, yeah, of course. Me. You know, I want to get, I want to, I want to see the light. And you want to clear your mind? <laughs> uh, well, or fill it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if other people get on board with it, that's great. If they don't get on board with it, that's great. It doesn't affect how, it doesn't affect me and my. Right. My well, that's good. That's good. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to share about yourself or mention? Well, I just am very happy to speak with you, Tori. I mean, you're a lovely, lovely person. And Thank you so much. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really look forward to what you have next, what your mind paints next. <laughs> it's like watching a movie. It's like your, um, like your film. It's like a reel. Like, I feel like your painting is like, created by your brain that has this reel that's projecting this movie. <laughs>
or this. Yeah, well, what's going to happen next? I don't know. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you again. Thank you so much.